If you grew up in the 1980s, you probably heard a story about a guy who was so convinced his D&D game was real that he went down into some steam tunnels and died like he was in an actual dungeon. Today, I'll talk about the movie they made about it and why the whole thing is a bunch of crap. Got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. I'm gonna take you to the bank. To the blood bank. Welcome, B-Movie Maniacs, to another episode of B-Movie Babylon. A safe space for trash cinema lovers where we firmly believe the B in B-Movie stands for brilliant. I'm your host, Mike Bracken. Some of you may know me as the Horror Geek on YouTube or from my stint on Comedy Central's old pop culture game show, Beat the Geeks. Others will remember me as that dick on social media. And really, I'm all of the above. No matter how you know me, thanks for being here as we stock the forgotten corners of the video store in search of the best B-movies ever made. Whether you love martial arts mayhem, low-budget rip-offs of popular movies, direct-to-video Skinamax flicks, classic horror fair, sleaze or exploitation, I've got you covered. Today, we're talking about the dangers of Dungeons and & Dragons and the terrible film they made about the real-life passing of a college student in 1980 that got wrongly linked to the game and helped kick Satanic Panic into high gear. So buckle up, because we're about to take a deep dive into the bonkers story of 1982's deliriously stupid Mazes and Monsters, which also has the distinction of being Tom Hanks' first leading man film role, although he doesn't seem to like to talk about it much. Alright, let's dive into my backstory with this one. As I have said many times on this show, growing up in the 1980s was pretty magical, but it was also kinda weird too. We had the first generation of video games, we got to experience the first VCRs, we had home computers and saw how technology was going to change the world pretty dramatically firsthand. But the 80s were also a weirdly backwards time in some ways too. For all of the technological advances, a huge segment of this country was terrified of the devil and his pernicious influence on a generation of wide-eyed, corn-fed American youth. This movement, and I use that term very loosely, was christened as Satanic Panic. Normal, seemingly well-adjusted and responsible adults were suddenly convinced Satan was everywhere, and he wanted their kids. Without divine intervention and clean godly living, the streets of America would run red with the blood of ritual sacrifice victims offered to the Dark Lord. Honestly, if you didn't live through the satanic panic, it's really sort of hard to wrap your head around it. Because honestly, it's the same bullshit that gave us stuff like the Salem Witch Trials, an event that most of us today look at and go, why were these people so hysterically superstitious and stupid? And yet, almost exactly 300 years later, Americans were once again swept up in a religious fervor, many firmly convinced there was a secret satanic empire running the world. Almost nothing was safe from being labeled as a tool of the devil by the conservative Christian movement back in those days. Rock and heavy metal music contained demonic messages hidden in lyrics. Horror movies and TV shows were indoctrinating children into a secular and evil lifestyle. Hell, even the Care Bears were considered a tool of the Dark One. One of the biggest targets of the period, and something the Christian conservatives really latched onto, were role-playing games, namely Dungeons & Dragons. TSR's wildly popular fantasy role-playing game, wherein players created fantasy avatars that could wage battle and use magic against mythical creatures, was really just a mix of classic wargaming, which had been around forever, crossed with the fantasy setting and creatures of Tolkien's Middle-earth and other high fantasy texts. But to the conservative Karens of that era, playing D&D was a one-way ticket to hell. Which is sort of hilarious, because I lived through that era and played a lot of D&D, &D, and mostly it was a one-way ticket to never getting laid back then. I mean, the idea that D&D &D was an introductory course in the study of black magic and the occult is a lot like arguing that Monopoly is an introductory course in how to become a real estate mogul. D&D &D was first published way back in, like, January of 1974. The game's initial print run consisted of three different books in a wood grain box and was limited to just 1,000 handmade copies. This run and subsequent print runs sold out quickly, and by the early 1980s, TSR, the game's parent company, was selling over 12,000 units per month. This rapid growth and newfound success turned out to be something of a double-edged sword for D&D, though. A growing fan base eager to spend money on new rulebooks and adventures was great, but the game also became a lightning rod for controversy during this satanic panic hysteria of the 1980s. Like heavy metal rock music and horror movies, D&D was an easy target for politicians and religious leaders looking to fearmonger over the moral decay of America. 
The game's compendium of monsters, which featured devils and demons from various world religions and things like magic and necromancy, was an irresistible siren song to the so-called moral majority on a quest to stomp out anything they deemed illicit or immoral. Despite the increased sales and constant attacks from detractors, D&D was still a niche passion. The average American might have heard of it in the early 80s, but most didn't know much about it beyond the name and maybe the supposed doorways to evil the game opened that you might hear about at Sunday service. Anyway, it must have been Christmas 1981 or 1982 when I had my first D&D experience. I got a lot of toys at Christmas as a kid, and my dad was big into finding things that were cool and different for me. That year, I was still very much into Star Wars and Masters of the Universe, and I'm pretty sure that was the Christmas I got my Castle Grayskull, which was the biggest box under the tree. But hidden in that hall was another smaller package that I immediately assumed was some sort of book. As I tore open the wrapping paper, I realized it wasn't a book. It was a red box with a barbarian guy fighting a giant dragon. It was a D&D starter set, and I was immediately fascinated. I would have been 9 or 10, depending on which year this was, and I really didn't know much about D&D other than I'd heard people talk about it as this really cool game. I loved games back then, both video and board games, and so I actually wound up diving into this box that very morning right after I set up my Castle Grayskull. Inside the box was the rule book and dice and character sheets, but no board, which definitely puzzled young me. I mean, I had no idea how to play this thing. No one ever offered to play with me, and I lived in a rural neighborhood with nothing but girls around who were absolutely not going to play D&D. But I read the book and learned the basic rules, and there was even a starter campaign in there that I ran through by myself. <laughs> I loved it, but since I had no one to actually play with, the game basically was relegated to my stack of games in my closet by the end of winter break. I'd look at it regularly, thinking about how awesome it would be to play in a group, but I just didn't have a group. And in the pre-internet days, you weren't getting a group together if they weren't local. But I was now very interested in D&D, and suddenly the game was in the news for all the wrong reasons. And it all started with one weird name, James Dallas Egbert III. Egbert was essentially what we'd call a child prodigy. Born in 1962 in Dayton, Ohio, Egbert excelled at school. He was so successful, in fact, that he entered Michigan State University at the tender age of 16 as a computer science major. At MSU, Egbert struggled to fit in. Being only 16 and surrounded by young adults as old as their early 20s, this makes sense. However, the struggle was only compounded by Egbert's social awkwardness. According to reports, young Dallas felt very isolated and lonely while at MSU, but he did try to make friends. One of those attempts involved joining the Campus Dungeons & Dragons group, and this event would become a key element of the tragedy of Egbert's short life. Reports vary as to how involved Egbert actually was with the group and D&D as a whole. I've read conflicting stories stating that he was very involved with the role-playing game, and others that report he was mostly a dabbler who got into it in a short-lived attempt to fit in. Whatever the case was, it's clear that Egbert did interact with the school's D&D community. He also struggled with depression, the weight of expectations placed on him by his parents, particularly a mother often categorized as domineering, and his burgeoning bisexuality. All of these things eventually led Dallas to drugs, and they absolutely played a bigger role in the end of his life than Dungeons & Dragons. Not that you'd know that if you followed the media coverage. On August 15th, 1979, Dallas had lunch with some acquaintances and then disappeared from his dorm at MSU's Case Hall. He left behind an ominous note and then set out for the university's old power plant. The plant had steam tunnels underneath it, which was presumably where Egbert would carry out his plan to end his misery once and for all. Fortunately, Egbert's plan failed, but he didn't go back to his dorm, he instead went to stay with an older male friend. Then, like a thief in D&D, he basically just vanished. It wasn't until five days later, on August 20th, that Egbert's parents learned of his disappearance. Michigan police were convinced it was simply a case of a lonely kid running away over bad grades and other issues, but Egbert's folks were not sold on this theory, or pleased with the state of the police investigation. And this is where things get interesting, and the story you've likely heard, that Dallas Egbert was so convinced his D&D life was real that it cost him his very real normal life, comes into existence. Looking for outside help with the investigation, Dallas' uncle gets in touch with private investigator Bill Deere. Deere is very much the definition of larger-than-life Texan. Gold rings, guns, dramatic adventures, southern drawl, the whole nine. Dude was a walking caricature in a lot of ways. 
Deer agrees to take the case and comes to Michigan to investigate. And while working leads, he finds pushpins in a strange pattern on a board in Egbert's room and eventually concludes that this is a map of the nearby steam tunnels. Deer was apparently right on this count, but what happens next spawned at least a decade's worth of Dungeons and Dragons as a gateway to hell rhetoric and was the catalyst for today's movie. The detective ultimately concocted multiple theories about what might have happened to Egbert. Some of these were more plausible than others. Several involved Egbert heading into the tunnels as part of a D&D campaign. Investigator Deer, realizing that Egbert was depressed and struggling with his sexuality, appears to have chosen to protect the young man by pushing the D&D theory rather than the doping and the confusion over his sexuality. And the ravenous press ran with it. The media couldn't get enough of the story about how a kid in a role-playing game snapped and became obsessed with the game to the point where he thought it was real. If you were following along, you could literally watch a moral panic being born in real time. In fact, the media so loved that narrative that when Deer later found Egbert alive and well, that story wasn't reported with nearly the same fervor as the D&D game Gone Awry narrative they'd breathlessly pushed for weeks. And why would it be? Was the story of a socially awkward, depressed computer prodigy running away from his life and sexuality even half as interesting as the story of someone dying because they believed they were a real-life D&D character? Short answer? Hell no. Naturally, the media coverage put D&D in the public spotlight. Next thing you know, authorities, religious leaders, politicians, and even dreadful Christian cartoonist Jack Chick were warning parents that D&D was the first step on the road to eternal damnation. Which, again, is funny, because back then it was mostly the first step on the road to getting stuffed in lockers and made fun of. The media frenzy did not stop there, though. In a ripped-from-the-headlines move that predated Law & Order by well over a decade, novelist Rona Jaffe cranked out a terrible novel called Mazes and Monsters in 1981. The book was clearly inspired by the Egbert story and features a group of college kids playing a D&D clone called Mazes and Monsters, because no one wanted to get sued by TSR, and they're playing this game in the caves at a fictional university. Naturally, all of these characters are socially stunted or damaged, which makes them extra susceptible to the dark influences of D&D. <laughs> I mean, mazes of monsters. Also, never mind that this was more of a LARP or a live-action roleplay than a D&D thing. Clearly, Jaffe was not concerned about getting the details right. For her part, she admits that she cranked out the book in a few days because she was worried other writers would beat her to the punch. <laughs> Obviously, the book took a lot of creative liberties with the story. But it gets worse. CBS turned the novel into an even more terrible movie with the same name in 1982. Mazes and Monsters is notable for a number of reasons. It's Tom Hanks' first leading role. Murray Hamilton, the mayor from Jaws, plays a tough-talking cop working the case, and it's filled with hilariously awful dialogue, including a sequence where Tom Hanks wants to leap from the Twin Towers because he believes he can fly thanks to his character's magic spells. To be fair, Jaffe wasn't the only one to try and cash in on the case. Author John Coyne gave us the equally dreadful Hobgoblin in 1981. That one features another character obsessed with a role-playing game, this one called, you guessed it, Hobgoblin. Coyne, for his part, insists the Egbert case didn't influence him, but I'll let you decide that for yourself. At any rate, I remember a relentless onslaught of ads for Mazes and Monsters in 1982. The film debuted on CBS on December 28th that year, and I distinctly recall watching football that Sunday and Pat Summerall plugging the upcoming airing of that damn movie at least a hundred times. Even though it was winter break, I don't think I managed to stay up and watch Mazes and Monsters that December. I mean, beyond maybe the first 30 minutes. This was probably for the best, because it's pretty dreadful, but campy in all the right ways. I did manage to see the full film a few years later, though. And holy shit. What a weird slice of 80s insanity this thing is. It's even crazier in the 2020s. Ah, oh, and before we get into the actual film, I suppose I should point out that my parents never bought into the satanic panic shit on any level. They didn't take away my music, they didn't forbid me from watching horror movies, they didn't burn my D&D starter set in a fire in an effort to rid our home of demonic influences. And eventually we moved to Florida, and I found kids to play D&D with. To this day, I like to sit here and play Hero Quest or Descent Legends of the Dark and a bunch of other D&D inspired dungeon crawlers. Satan still hasn't lured me to the dark side. Well, maybe he has. I mean, I'm kind of evil. All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about Mazes and Monsters and the terrible legacy it spawned. Trust me, it'll be fun. The 
key thing to remember here, above all else, is that Mazes and Monsters is a stupid movie. It's based on a stupid book that was clearly designed to cash in on a trending story, and it shows. I haven't read Mazes and Monsters since I was in college, but I recall it being laugh out loud bad in many spots. I'll admit that I've never read another Rona Jaffe book, but if this was indicative of her work, I'm amazed she had the career she did. In one really sort of interesting note, the book was adapted into a screenplay by none other than Tom Lazarus. Lazarus was the same guy who wrote Stigmata back in 1999 and wrote several screenwriting books, one of which, in the spirit of full disclosure, actually features a cover blurb from yours truly. I think Tom's a great writer, and I don't blame him for this cinematic abomination on any level, really. He had to adapt a book that wasn't very good. You can't expect him to reinvent the wheel. Anyway, the movie is not complicated, and I'm not going to do a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown of the plot, because it basically follows the Dallas Egbert story with plenty of dramatic license taken to up the sensationalism. But you do get a real great idea of just how hammy this fucking thing is going to be in the very first scene where Murray Hamilton shows up with the cops at the caves near the fictional Grant University searching for our missing Tom Hanks. An older reporter is there, and Hamilton tells him, We think a game of mazes and monsters might have gotten out of hand. Do you know it? And the reporter is like, Mazes and monsters? My kids play that. And then he gives us this silly breakdown of what Normies thought D&D was. So right off the bat, this movie's happy to tell you this is an RPG hit piece, which is nice, because you can just get ready to laugh or go do something else with your time. From there, it's over to the university earlier in time as our four main gamers show up for a new semester. We meet JJ, the 16-year-old prodigy whose whole personality is defined through stupid hats and a domineering mother who redecorates his room every time he leaves. Then there's Hunky Daniel, who's got parents who don't understand why he'd want to make silly computer games instead of being a captain of industry. And he's way too good looking to be playing D&D &D to boot. We also get to meet Kate, who apparently can't keep a man and somehow plays this dorky game while trying to become a writer. And finally, we get Tom Hanks as Robbie, a guy who flunked out of his previous college after getting too into mazes and monsters and clearly has some mental health issues. Interestingly, the film tries to represent Dallas Egbert through the three male characters. JJ is the closest analog to the real Dallas. He's 16 and in college. He's awkward, he has a domineering mom, and he actually talks about going into the nearby caves to hurt himself. Daniel represents the computer science part of the real Dallas. Not that it ever really figures into the plot. But the film really focuses on Hanks' Robbie, who plays a cleric named Pardue, who is very clearly suffering a break with reality. Anyway, after some slight cajoling, they get Hanks to play, and he and Kate fall in love, but they want to take the game to the next level by basically making it a live-action roleplay in the nearby caves. And it's here that Hanks has his break with reality, coming to believe he's actually Pardue, the game is real, and that he must dump Kate and become pure enough to find the two towers so he might gain entrance to the Great Hall. Eventually, he heads off on his quest, stabbing a guy he's convinced is actually a monster from the game, and then finds the two towers with the help of a crazy homeless guy, who I never realized until today was played by veteran character actor Chris Wiggins, who was Jack Marshak on Friday the 13th the series, a show I happen to adore. Hanks' quest requires him to take a leap of faith off of the Twin Towers, but his gaming group shows up and insists he can't because he doesn't have enough points to complete that action. And <laughs> really, I wish I was making this up. This scene is astonishingly terrible. But they do save him, and then go to visit him at his parents' house months later, where we learn that Robbie is still convinced the game is real. And in the most baffling narrative decision of all, the film ends with him going on one last adventure. <laughs> I mean, sure, feed the guy's psychosis, I guess. Normally, Mazes and Monsters, both the book and the film, would have been made, released, and quickly forgotten. There's nothing in either work to make it some sort of enduring classic in the realm of cinema or literature. The book was a crass attempt to cash in on Jaffe's part, and the film was a more crass attempt to cash in on CBS's part, which is why the film was airing like a mere year after the book was published. However, fate had other ideas, and this film, which feels more like a terribly dated after-school special than an actual piece of cinema, became a focal point not only in the war on Dungeons and Dragons, but also in the burgeoning paranoia of satanic panic that was about to sweep the nation. Let's take another quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the legacy of Mazes and Monsters, and how the conservative Christian movement co-opted this story as part of their culture war to save the soul of America. I'm 
Unfortunately, there are no happy endings to this story. Pretty much everything that happened in the wake of Dallas Egbert's initial disappearance is sad, depressing, and disappointing. As for Egbert, P.I. Bill Deere found him alive and well and brought him home. Dallas enrolled in another university and then dropped out and eventually moved in with a friend. After several more attempts to end his pain, he passed away on August 16th, 1980 almost a year to the day after the events that started this whole media circus in the first place. Naturally, this did not get a lot of press. It just wasn't nearly as exciting as the D&D narrative. Jaffe's book sold well, and the movie was modestly successful. Did it launch Tom Hanks' career? Not really, but the sensationalism of it all has kept it in the pop culture discussion for four decades now, despite the fact that the book and the movie are both pretty awful. The really depressing thing here is that Jaffe's book and the film have transcended their fictional roots. Mazes of Monsters was a novel, not a work of nonfiction. Jaffe took the sensationalized elements of the early days of Dallas Egbert's disappearance and built them into a fictional tale. But somewhere along the line, everyone forgot about the fictional part of her story. So the first thing I want to point out here is that a lot of awful shit came in the immediate wake of Mazes of Monsters, and a lot of it moves beyond just being a film review on a movie podcast. This is one of those cases where you can look at a film and see how it was used as propaganda for a bunch of people with an agenda to push. I feel like that's extremely timely in today's world, where we've seen definite flashes of a resurgence in satanic panic, magical thinking, and conspiracy theories. There is a part of me that doesn't want to entirely blame Rona Jaffe for the mess her work created. I don't know enough about her to say that she really believed D&D was the linchpin in some vast satanic conspiracy or not. Personally, I suspect that she didn't. I think she mostly just saw an easy opportunity to write a trendy book on a story that had people's attention and took it. That being said, that doesn't exonerate her for writing a book she clearly didn't research very well. Her grasp of how D&D even works is tenuous at best and often outright incorrect. I'll give Jaffe this. Mazes and Monsters does not run with the typical satanic panic D&D playbook. The film isn't really focused on the things the Christians found so problematic with the game. It's really not about Robbie believing he can do real magic. I mean, he does at the World Trade Center, but it's clearly because he's delusional. Not that he has real powers the Christians like to insist would happen if you just gave the game your soul. Instead, Jaffe's book takes a slightly more pragmatic approach, sort of dancing around the idea that an RPG could harm people already prone to mental illness or flights of fantasy. The problem is it never really does a very good job of making that point. And as we all know, it could just as easily be a copy of Catcher in the Rye, a Beatles lyric, or a neighbor's talking dog that sets someone off. But the film and the book run with this idea that it was a D&D clone that was the real threat. And again, in a work of fiction, this should be okay. But the problem with Mazes and Monsters is that it's clearly a work of fiction that was taken up and had people believing it was based on a true story. The rip from the headline's nature really muddies the water here with many people myself included, believing that Dallas Egbert died in some steam tunnels in real life after having a break with reality and believing his D&D game was real. And as we've already discussed, that is not what happened. At all. Yet if you ask the average person about this case, they'll tell you a kid died in the steam tunnels because he had a break with reality and believed he was his D&D character. Few people seem to know that Dallas Egbert didn't go into those tunnels to pretend he was a wizard, nor did he die in them. It took me years to learn the real story, and I suspect for at least some of you, this is your first time hearing it. That's how pervasive this urban legend has become. And that's the real kicker. The novel and the movie and the sensationalistic media coverage spawned an entire series of urban legends. There are countless stories where someone knows someone who went to college with kids who played D&D in some isolated, dangerous locale. Invariably, someone snaps and kills someone, or they get lost and die of hypothermia, or they starve, or some other ridiculous thing. <laughs> Except none of it ever happened. It's all made up. It would be easy to look at all of this and parcel a huge chunk of the blame to private investigator Bill Deere. After all, Deere is the guy who floated the D&D theory that the press ran with in the first place. Without that, this story never takes off. We never get mazes and monsters, and maybe we miss Hobgoblin, or maybe not. The politicians and preachers continue on, oblivious to D&D, and maybe Satanic Panic doesn't take off in quite the same way. I'm dubious about that last one, but this story certainly played a role in whipping up the devil next door fervor in the early days of the Satanic Panic craze, which, like the urban legends I just mentioned, has also been thoroughly debunked. However, before we blame Bill Deere, there are a few things to consider. 
Back in 1984, Deer wrote his own book on the Egbert case titled Dungeon Master. Dungeon Master looked to set the record straight and point out that Dallas Egbert's initial disappearance had nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons. Deer spent a fair amount of time with Egbert after finding him in 1979. He knew what the young man was really struggling with. So why did he let the D&D angle dominate the spotlight for so long? The short answer is presumably because he didn't want to air Egbert's real issues publicly. Dallas Egbert was already struggling with his sexuality and his mental state. Putting that out in the media wouldn't have helped him. Deer, it appears, really tried to protect Dallas and only told his tale after his passing. Beyond that, Deer was hardly the only guy who ran with this story. There's a great chapter in the Fab Press book, Satanic Panic, Pop Cultural Paranoia in the 1980s, covering the crusade against D&D waged by people like Patricia Pooling and her Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons group. There are also other crackpots who insisted they'd been drafted into Satan's service as part of the game and now wanted to save innocent souls. The stories are hilariously outlandish and totally ridiculous and involve kooky shit, like a story about how a kid summoned a demon from the game into his room, or how parents heard demonic screams from the melting miniatures as they burned D&D sets in an effort to purge their homes of satanic presences. I mean, again, just some real Salem Witch Trials level of bonker shit here. The book, which I highly recommend, also has a chapter about what might be the most infamous piece of anti-D&D propaganda of all. Jack Chick's 1984 Christian comic tract, Dark Dungeons. I'm guessing if you have any interest in satanic panic and weird kooky Christian stuff, you're already well aware of Jack Chick and this comic. But if you're not, it's a hilariously stupid piece about a girl D&D player being indoctrinated into real witchcraft after partaking in the game. Honest to God, I'd love to do a show about the devil in popular culture and all the goofy shit that has sprung up over the years. I can do like a whole season on Jack Chick alone. Mazes of Monsters and Deer's Proclamations might have opened the floodgates, but Egbert's parents never blamed the game. Other people did that, which led to D&D bannings over satanic implications in places like Utah and Oklahoma. For their part, TSR and Gary Gygax found themselves in a sort of interesting predicament with all of the fuss over the game. On the one hand, no one wants to be the company that makes a game that people insist kills kids or opens portals to hell. On the other, there's no such thing as bad press, and the satanic panic buzz over D&D definitely helped the company's bottom line. So, in a really weird move, the company was not particularly active when it came to combating the crazy accusations being leveled against it. Gygax did go on 60 Minutes in 1985 and came away unhappy from the experience. It appears that Ed Bradley and the 60 Minutes team were mostly interested in promoting the narrative the game was evil. Gygax says they changed the order of his responses and presented things in a different light than he did. The TSR team received death threats and the like, to the point where Gygax actually moved to a secret location and apparently even had a bodyguard for a time. But mostly, they just let this whole thing run its course. In retrospect, that was probably a mistake. They also sort of made matters even worse when they appeared to cave to some of the pressure surrounding these controversies in 1989. That year, the second edition of Advanced D&D removed all references to devils, demons, and other supernatural monsters and rechristened them with new names. Naturally, hardcore players still call them by their original names. By the late 90s, Wizards of the Coast now owned the brand and they reinstated the devil and demon terminology because they felt the removal was basically just TSR making an empty gesture of appeasement to their critics. And really, they had a point when they said it didn't matter what you called the creatures in the books. As soon as some conservative moral majority crusader saw a picture of a gargoyle, they were going to assume it was demonic no matter what you called it. In the spirit of fairness, it should be noted that there are people who take issue with Bill Deere and his book Dungeon Master as well. Egbert's mother and family have accused Deere of over-dramatizing things and taking artistic liberty with the story. MSU police also dispute some of the points in the book, most notably Deere's assertions about how dangerous the steam tunnels really were. I also find his take on D&D pretty suspect. He's basically said he played to see what it was about and found it not necessarily evil, but that it weighed heavy on him or some other bullshit. Given Deere's larger-than-life personality and the nature of writing nonfiction in general, I wouldn't be surprised if there are discrepancies or embellishments in Dungeon Master. But I also don't believe any of those examples of artistic license actually changed the real story. Dallas Egbert was a troubled young genius whose death was co-opted by conservative politicians and religious leaders to push an agenda. Then Rona Jaffe turned it into a terrible novel and movie, and we're still talking about it 40 years later. 
Another person who doesn't believe Deere's motives were so altruistic is Timothy Cask. Cask, who was apparently TSR's first employee in the early days of Dungeons & Dragons and went on to edit the Dragon magazine, has a less than glowing assessment of Bill Deere's motives. He, Bill Deere, was a publicity hound and he knew he could hang it all on D&D. And he did. Given Deere's penchant for sensationalism and love of the spotlight, it's totally plausible that he did indeed see an opportunity in blaming D&D. If we follow that line of logic to its cynical conclusion, Deere attempted to milk the last few bucks out of the controversy with Dungeon Master. We'll probably never know for sure, but I like to think that Deere really was trying to protect Alice Egbert's privacy. But maybe that makes me naive. I mean, Deere did write OJ is innocent and I can prove it back in 2012, so his motives certainly can be questioned. But if Dungeon Master really were just another attempt to cash in, why exonerate Dungeons and Dragons? There was a lot more money to be made on the It's a Tool of the Dark Lord circuit back in 1984. Eventually, the whole satanic panic thing ran out of steam. And I'd like to think it was because the sane adults in the room finally said enough and that was that. But in reality, it was more a case of the boy who cried wolf. Far too many people were willing to listen to kooks like Patricia Pooling who were promising the streets would run red with a river of blood if we didn't stop this evil menace. And when that never happened, everyone kind of moved on to whatever the next thing was. We then learned that basically all of this stuff, the recovered memories and all of it, was bullshit. Of course, by then, the damage was done. Whatever motives you believe, there are some key takeaways from this story. The first is that D&D wasn't really a portal for the demons of hell to take over your life. The second is that sensationalism sells, and the more lurid a story, the better. The media and Rona Jaffe ran with the D&D angle even though it was quickly proven wrong. And in typical media fashion, no one put much effort into setting the record straight as the new details came to light. <laughs> what a shocker. And finally, the real tragedy here is that a smart, promising young man died not because of games and wizards and orcs, but because he was lonely and conflicted and unhappy. He was then turned into an unwitting pawn to push an agenda. Egbert told Deer that D&D was one of the few bright spots in his troubled life, a way to actually escape from his awkwardness and unhappiness for a few hours at a time. As for D&D, this was just one of numerous controversies the game found itself embroiled in over the years. Some of those involved the same things this case did, while others were more focused around battles with the Tolkien estate and other more mundane business issues. At any rate, D&D has continued to thrive. In fact, you don't have to play in your mom's basement, the AV club room, or a band camp these days. D&D has gone mainstream. Parent company, Wizards of the Coast, had revenue of $816 million in 2020. Sure, some of that comes from Magic the Gathering, but D&D figures in there too. Rolling a D20 has never been cooler. Alright, if you somehow still want to see this thing despite me taking a big steaming dump on it for this whole episode, I'll give you some movies to pair with it for your next movie marathon after the break. If you've never seen Mazes and Monsters, the good news is you can see it for free with ads over on YouTube. I can't even imagine shelling out cash to watch this thing, but if you really wanted to own it, it's on disc too, I think. It's not really a film I'd recommend in the traditional sense. It's very clearly a schmaltzy, made-for-TV movie that's more fun to riff than to actually watch. But you do you, and I do think it's worth seeing just to see what the media thought D&D was all about back in the day. If you've ever played D&D, this thing will make you laugh and rage in equal measure. But no one wants a movie night that's just one movie, so allow me to be your cult movie concierge and suggest several other films to pair well with Mazes and Monsters for your next movie marathon. First up, I'm going to highly recommend the LARPing documentary Darkon. This underseen 2006 documentary is about a group of LARPers playing a very elaborate medieval war game called Darkon. You see these players in their normal day-to-day -day life, then watch them transform into warriors clad in cardboard and foam for epic battles over fictional land in a local park and forest. There's something charming, touching, and a little bit sad about Darkon, but I love how passionate the players are and how they all find the game a satisfying way to take a break from their mundane, normal lives. <laughs> really, it all looks kind of fun. I'd totally go out to play Darkon one Saturday afternoon if I was there. As a bonus pick, if you like that, you can also check out 2010 Skull World, which treads similar ground from what I can tell. I've always wanted to see that one and somehow never have. 
If you'd like a more interesting fictional D&D movie, you should definitely check out Knights of bad <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm a little hesitant to recommend this one, only because I know there was a lot of drama with production and director Joe Lynch was not happy with the way they did the final cut of the film. That being said, I still find it good dumb fun. It's got Peter Dinklage and a bunch of other guys having to fight real monsters, and it's as goofy as it sounds. But it's also definitely entertaining. It won't change your life, but it's still a good way to round out your evening. And as another bonus pick, someone made a hilarious 40-minute version of Jack Chick's Dark Dungeons comic. Trust me, you'll want to see it. Alright, that's enough blabbing from me. Let's wrap this thing up. While Mazes and Monsters might have faded into relative obscurity, its legacy endures as a poignant cautionary tale, echoing the broader implications of sensationalism and the potential consequences of misunderstanding niche subcultures. The film and novel's exploration of the perceived dangers of immersive fantasy gaming, which were so clearly flawed and sensationalized, inadvertently thrust the nascent world of tabletop role-playing games into the spotlight. What eventually emerged from this tumultuous period was a broader conversation about the need for a nuanced understanding of the relationship between fantasy games and real-world behavior. Critics argued that Mazes of Monsters and similar narratives perpetuated harmful stereotypes train gamers as mentally unstable individuals prone to confusion between reality and fantasy. This characterization, they contended, not only stigmatized a burgeoning subculture, but also fueled a broader cultural panic about the supposed dangers lurking in the realm of imaginative play. As the years passed, the fervor surrounding mazes and monsters and the broader D&D controversy gradually subsided. In the end, the gaming community persevered and D&D evolved into a cultural mainstay influencing subsequent generations of writers, filmmakers, and artists. The game is celebrating a 50th birthday and getting a series of postage stamps to commemorate the event, a far cry from the book and game burnings Mazes and Monsters helped inspire. And <laughs> really, I can't think of anything more fitting than that. Have you seen Mazes and Monsters, or is this your first experience with it? Leave me a comment and let me know. I may feature some on future episodes. If you're watching on YouTube, please consider liking and subscribing. If you're on another podcast platform, leave me a review and share with your friends. It helps me keep making these shows. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, and you've just taken another trip to B-Movie Babylon. The video vault is now closed.